Thanks for tuning into our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. If you have any questions or want a little bit more info on anything going on here at Coastal, check out our website at ccoceancity.com. Today, Matthew will be continuing our study in the book of Philippians. So here's Matthew. So, welcome back Thursday nights. If you brought your word, please open up to chapter 2 in Philippians. If you did not bring one, there is a copy underneath the seat in front of you. Please take advantage not only of the tangible word of God. It is so crucial to have your eyes on the scriptures as we're going through them. And if you have your smartphone, of course, you can open the app, which is going to have in advance the notes for you in case you miss something that might be said. But as we do begin, a quick review, I believe, is always so crucial. A review to renew. It is of no use, no good use at least, to hear a word one Sunday or one Thursday, nod in agreement, say amen, take some really good notes, and then leave and not do anything about it. We are so easily persuaded that we have to be in a hurry to get to the next chapter, to get to the next verse, to get to the next sermon. Why would I spend time building this up? I'll tell you, as an administer of the gospel, it is easier for me to prepare and preach a hundred sermons than it is to live one. Amen. I could prepare messages. You can receive messages. But the divide exists when we leave and don't apply the messages. We need to be doers of the word. We need to be, of course, as we come together, unified. So as we've labored in the past several weeks, we got out of chapter one, where Paul the apostle is penning a church in the city of Philippi, reminding them, of course, to be on guard against external oppositions. However, with the external oppositions, Paul understood it is of no good use to be on guard against external opposition if you're not unified and combative towards internal divisions. Now, remember, when Paul's writing this, he's not writing to a non-believing community. I think we often miss that. He's writing to the church. He's writing to us. Believers who are called to a higher standard. And then he begins chapter two by saying, hey, if you guys agree that there's been encouragement in Christ in your walk, if you would agree that there is so much comfort of great love in the Father, if you would agree that there's been fellowship in the Spirit, if you have any affection, any compassion, any mercy, loyal love, fulfill my joy. Fulfill my joy that when I hear that you're getting along, you have one mind, you have one purpose to point to Jesus. He says, I will have a joy that is not only full, it will overflow. Amen. And then you stop and say, we like that. It sounds good. God will be glorified with unity in the body. Yet how do we accomplish it? He then says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. You see that he gives us a negative so that we can uphold a positive. He's saying, hey, you want to keep unity? Then don't do anything out of selfishness. Selfishness will accomplish division. What else will accomplish division? In the body, empty conceit, vain glory. It's when any of us rises up and believes that we are the captain of our own success or destiny, and it's all God. He has actually ordained each of us to be here in this moment. I mean, we could settle on that thought alone. We have been ordained. He foresaw us in this moment to be here for such a time as this to be used by him, to be unified. Because the greatest tool that God will use to reach a divided world is a unified church or a unified Christian. In other words, when the world around me is so divided, what they need to see is the unity that exists in me when I'm not divided. And they see it and they say, I want that. And they're curious about that. It's not about how much Bible you know, it's about how much word you do. How much word you do, doing the word. 
Because when they see that, I'm telling you, they say, that's uncommon. Everybody's at each other's necks. I want to know, how are you so unified? And we know Jesus said, hey, if I'm lifted up, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, children. I'll draw all people, black, white, yellow, all backgrounds. I'll draw all races, all even types of religions will come. Because sometimes it takes being religious minded to come to know a relational mind. Many of you in here were raised with religion. The day you came to relationship, everything opened up. Hey, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, lowliness of mind is the term. It's a derogatory term, in fact, but Paul takes it and says, I'm going to redeem the term and say, hey, the Christian should have a low mind, not a high mind. What is humility? It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking of yourself at all. It's not putting yourself down. It's lifting people up. I say humility is defined by understanding your insight into your own insignificance in light of his magnificence. That's humility. Amen. It's like I have insight into that. I am so insignificant in the grand scheme of God's plan. And what humbles me is that he chooses to use me. And it's his magnificence that humbles me. He then says, oh yeah, by the way, don't just look out for your own interests. That's good if you do, but look out for the interests of others. That's God. See, good people look out for themselves, but God's people, we look out for others. And then he comes out of those few verses and he's going to make a case for Christ. He is going to say, hey, I know that sounds lofty. It's a challenge. But how about I give you the prime example of the one who did just that, who laid down himself so that we could be actually lifted up. And then he says in verse five, we're only going to verse seven tonight for a reason. Verses five through 11, in fact, are known as one of the most profound doctrines in the scriptures. And I'm not going to labor in that. I just want you to hear it and allow the weight of the scriptures to crush you, actually, to humble you, to push you towards the cross. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 5. Now, in light of what has just been said, we cannot overlook or forget the links of truth that we just covered because this mind in you is in relation to the mind that Paul just presented for you. He's saying the mind that does two things, it esteems others better than yourself and it looks out for the interests of others. Those two mindsets. He says, let that mind be in you. Oh yeah, by the way, which was also in Christ. Amen. The mind that esteemed others better than himself. He said, how did Jesus esteem others better than himself? Well, that's an easy one. He not only spent time dealing with the lowly in the society, he spent time dealing with the marginalized, the forgotten, the broken. He spent time, of course, communing and fellowshipping with tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes. He esteemed them better than himself. But more than that, and what is often overlooked in this account, Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 15, deals with Jesus esteeming children. Then little children were brought to him, Jesus, that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. Now, it's uncertain who was bringing the children to Jesus. It could have been their parents. It could have been the uh, daycare keepers. It could have been that these children were orphans. There are many commentaries that say they may have been. Nonetheless, Here's why the disciples rebuked them from bringing the children to Jesus. Jesus was busy. He's in ministry. He doesn't have time to stop focusing on the masses, the adults, the primary audience to deal with children. Does that sound familiar even in today's society? But in that society, listen, church, children were not only not esteemed, they were not respected. They were put into the class with women. They weren't to speak in public. In fact, the only people that cared for or loved children was the family of those children. Society thought children were a nuisance. They tolerated children. Now do you see when Jesus actually 
in response to the disciples rebuking the people from bringing him the children, Jesus turns and rebukes them. But he takes something. It's remarkable. He takes a child, a nuisance on earth, and he makes them into an illustration for heaven. You want to talk about esteem? Watch what he does. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of heaven. Did you get that? He just gave the highest compliment to a child in the presence of the adults who tried to keep the children from him. And Jesus said, no, you're missing it. The childlike mentality, the simplicity, the sincerity, the sensitivity. Look, with wide-eyed wonder, they still look at the world. They're amazed at a bumblebee, at a bird. Yet you adults, taking life so seriously, overcomplicating it, stressing and worrying, you're forgetting about the kingdom of heaven. And he esteems the children to make that point. That's remarkable to me. Well, how did he look out for the needs of others? Of course, that was his ministry. But the deep needs of others, not just the physical or material needs, that's one thing for him to heal someone physically. It's an entirely different thing. I say it's an eternal thing to heal someone spiritually. I don't want to take too much time in this account, but John chapter 4 actually presents us with a woman at a well. And the woman is from Samaria. Jesus, being a Jew, of course, sitting at the well, engages her. His question, woman, give me a drink. Do you know the account? Interestingly, the question, he opens up the conversation with a leading question about his own need. But he's not interested in his own need. He's not interested in his own thirst. What he's doing is pulling out of her the fact that she is in desperate need of a spiritual thirst. And as we bring ourselves to this account, we see something. We see that her greatest need in that moment wasn't actually to be satisfied physically. Her greatest need in that moment was for her soul to be sanitized of shame. I know my soul is in great need to be sanitized of its shame. Amen. And when the Lord does that, as he's concerned about not just me being happy, not just me being healthy, he's concerned about me being holy and he has to sanitize my soul. And as he sanitizes my soul of shame, he doesn't stop there. He then satisfies my soul with his grace. Woo. He's concerned about our deepest needs. So as this mind was in him, Question, is that mind in you? Amen. In other words, are you more concerned about the spiritual needs and thirsts of the people in your life or maybe just concerned about their material needs? It's one thing to help somebody out physically, materially. I get that. That's great. That's good. But again, remember, what they're in desperate need for is what you're in desperate need for. You see, God's greatest deed is actually our greatest need forgiveness. You know how he accomplished forgiveness, right? He put himself on a cross. His mind was concerned about your need, our need, that he put himself on a cross to meet the need, to forgive us from our sins, to sanitize our souls, and then to satisfy our souls with his grace. Now I get that. In my capacity, in my humanity, though I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, there's one thing I can never do. I can never forgive you of your sins. As much as I want to, I can't. My point is this. We may not be able to forgive the sins of the soul, but we can bring people to the one who can. You know, I can come up with illustrations and do a lot of research and find the right story, the right testimony, but the word of God is the best illustrator to drive home these points. Watch this, Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. It deals with Jesus actually coming down into a certain city, out of the boat, crossing over. He comes, and it says, Then behold, they brought to Jesus a paralytic lying on a bed. This man is paralyzed. He has no mobility. He's actually helpless. He might be even hopeless. Watch this, amazing. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw not his faith, not the one who was paralyzed, when Jesus saw 
their faith. Who's the their in the account? It's the people that brought this friend of theirs to the one who could heal him, but not just heal him, to the one who can forgive him. Rhetorically, I ask, what's this got to do with us? When's the last time you, like these friends, lifted somebody else up and brought them to Jesus? When's the last time you lifted somebody else up in prayer and brought them to Jesus? You can't forgive the sins of their soul, but you can bring them to the one who can. When's the last time you lifted somebody else up by a text message and brought them to Jesus? Lifted them up in conversation with an encouragement and brought them to Jesus. That's what they did here. And it says Jesus saw their faith. He's going to see your faith on behalf of a loved one, a child, a friend, a coworker, and he sees you're laboring to lift them up, to bring them to the one who can sanitize their soul. That's the mind of Christ. Let that mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. The mind that is more concerned about me in a spiritual need. We stop and we ask, how do we get the mind of Christ to become the mind that governs our life? It's a good question. It's a very simple answer. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, transform your mind. Renew your mind. Do not allow your mind or your life to be conformed to the patterns of this world. Don't allow the culture, the world, to fit you into its mold. But transform your mind. Renew your mind. How? In the Word. Here's my definition for renewal. You ready? Renewal is removing the lies of the world and replacing it with the truth of the word. Removing the lies every day. Because when I wake up, there are new lies that are fighting for my mind. And the lies of the world will creep into my mind. And if I don't reset my mind in the word, if I don't renew my mind in the word, if I don't allow the word to transform my life, it is the complete opposite. The world is trying to put you into its mold from the outside in. It's pushing, it's squeezing. The word is trying to conform you to the image of Jesus from the inside out. That's the mind of God. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. That's a godly mind. Let this mind, which was in Jesus, who is God, be in you so you can have a godly mind. Well, let's talk about what godliness is. Godly. My definition, three words that are separate, as I'll explain them, but they're inseparable in application. To be like God is to be godly. The first H of being godly is to be holy. To be holy. There are several accounts in the Old Testament that actually say the same thing. It's God saying, hey, be holy, for I am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. Peter writes the same thought and says, God says, I've called you to be holy because I am holy. And we often think of holiness and we think of morality. Morality is part of holiness. It's a standard, but morality is not all of holiness. Holiness deals with Christ in us. Holiness isn't about what you don't do. Holiness is recognizing who you belong to. What? Yeah, holiness isn't about what I don't do. Look at me, I'm all keeping away from sin. No, holiness is about recognizing you belong to the Holy One. And listen, let me tell you something. Uh, tell your coworker this. I'm not trying to be all holier than thou. I'm just trying to be holier for thou. But there's something about holiness. When we get all holy, we sometimes get on a high horse. You cannot be holy unless you're also the second H, which is humble. See, to be godly is to be holy and humble. But not just humble where you are useless, because the third H is being holy, humble, and helpful. Holy, humble, and also helpful. It is the entire mind we already prefaced. Looking out for others, esteeming others over yourself. Let me say this. It's not about understanding holiness. It's about uniting. Just know that you are united with Christ. That's holiness. Be holy because I am holy. Let's continue. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Of course, 
being in the form of God, this is a most remarkable phrase. It is saying, simply put, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus, who is God. Not just he's like a form of God, not that he was godly, he is God. The word form is translated, Jesus is the essential nature and the entire character of God. I kind of joke when I say this, but I actually picture this, and I've said it before, but if God took a selfie of himself and posted it, the picture would be Jesus. He is the character of God. Colossians 1.15, again, Paul writes this, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the actual picture of the invisible God. Hey, what does God look like? Jesus. He is the visible representation of the invisible God. I love this. He is the form of God. I stop because I read this. This is a theological point that Jesus is God. So how do we make it practical? We ask ourselves, if Jesus is the picture of God, do I resemble God? Do I resemble Jesus? Do I look like Jesus in my actions, in my behavior, in my character, in my conversation, in my conduct? Do I allow the image of God to be reproduced within me? Now, I'm not talking about imitation. There are a lot of people walking around imitating Jesus, but they're not allowing Jesus to live through them. A monkey can imitate, a parrot can repeat. Wearing the name Christian doesn't make you like Christ. So what are we saying? We're talking about reproduction. Because the image of God in man was tainted, was fallen by sin. It was marred. It was disfigured. And then Jesus says, I want to renew the image of my Father in humanity. And he went to that cross to do so. So God's business today is to make us look more like Jesus. Like that's God's purpose, to make you look more like Jesus. And like a actual Polaroid, it often takes a dark period or a dark time to bring you to the perfect focus, the perfect focus. You ever wonder why a Polaroid goes into the dark before the image can be developed? Do you ever wonder why God allows us to go into darkness? Could it be that he's trying to bring his image to the surface? See, what am I talking about? I'm talking about living in the nature of Christ with the mind of Christ. It does not matter how much Bible you know if the fruit of the Spirit does not show. Because I know a lot of people that know a lot of Bible, yet they got no fruit. They got no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, no kindness in their life, no gentleness, no self-control, no faithfulness. But they know Bible, but they have no fruit. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. This, again, is connected to being in the form of God, being God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. This is an interesting translation. It's saying, Jesus is God, so how can you steal or rob something that is yours? By him claiming to be God, by him claiming that him and his father were one, He's not robbing anything. If you saw me coming out of my house with my possessions, you cannot accuse me of being a robber. See, Jesus is God. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In another sense, though equality with God, he did not take advantage of this quality. Let me say it like this. Though he possessed it, he chose not to use it to his own advantage. Though Jesus possessed all the divine attributes, all the divine authority, all the divine sovereignty, he chose not to use those qualities to his own advantage. I do not know about you, but I would have in a second. Now, let me help you, church. Let me equip you. There will be people that say Jesus is not God. In fact, every false religion in the world has that in common. They say that Jesus is not God. The moment they diminish his divinity, you can identify a false religion. There are many looking like Christianity religions, but they don't honor Jesus as God. They are false religions. John chapter five will be where you need to point those people. 
I call John chapter 5 alone the divine discourse. It's amazing. Jesus heals a man from an infirmity after 38 years of this man being in that condition, but he did it on the Sabbath. How dare he? And the religious folk, they hated that he broke this law and they confront him for healing a man on the Sabbath. And then there's a sub note that says, and he also claimed that he was like his father, claiming equality with God, it says. So they actually wanted to stone him. They wanted to kill him. And I love this because in response to that, you got to read it for yourself. It's a very long chapter. John chapter five, Jesus starts going on this divine discourse about, hey, me and my father, we are one. Me and my father have the same nature. Me and my father have the same authority. In fact, he gave me authority over life and death. In fact, he gave me authority to forgive sins. In fact, there's proof and evidence. There's testimonies that point to this. And then he says, you know, John the Baptist, the one that was a forerunner to me, you believe his word, he's talking about me. But I'm not going to take the testimony of a man. Hey, how about the works that I'm doing? The healings, the miracles. If you don't believe John the Baptist, believe the miracles. What are the odds? It's not odds. It's God that can heal the leper, that can heal the paralytic, that can heal those infirmed. Cast out demons. If you don't believe John, believe the works. By the way, if you don't believe the works, believe my father. Didn't you hear his voice? Didn't you hear it bellow from the heavens? Hey, were you there when I got baptized and the Holy Spirit fell upon me and the voice of my father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Did you hear that? Oh, you don't believe that much? At least believe the scriptures. Because then he says, you look into the scriptures, you search them, believing you'll find eternal life. But they speak of me. Do you understand? You're searching the scriptures for eternal life, yet I'm the one that possesses eternal life. You're searching in there, yet eternal life is right here. What is John chapter 5 expressing? Two words. He, God. He, God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. This is remarkable. Which direction do you go? I just came to the conclusion that Jesus is God. He said it out of his own mouth. They wanted to kill him because he said it. And I realized that he's God in the flesh. And although he was fully God, and he could have, get this, apathetically fixed us or wrathfully destroyed us. Do you understand? He was God. He didn't have to come to earth. He could have from a great distance indifferent to us, completely, with one word, fixed us, healed us. He could have, in, in wrath, destroyed us, yet he didn't. He decided to take it further. He decided to put on humanity and then empathetically feel us. See, what I did not say is the title of this message, and it's how Jesus felt us before he fixed us. What does that mean? We have a God who felt everything we would ever feel. Jesus felt everything, period. He decided to put skin on himself and come down to our level so he could feel us, feel our pain. Hebrews, write, the writer records that we have a high priest who can sympathize or empathize with our weaknesses, who was in all points, all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Can I kind of drive this home very specifically? You see, at the cross, this love of God in Christ is expressing, this is your sin I'm feeling. These are your tears I'm crying. This is your death I'm dying. And on the other side of this, my resurrection, my rising will lead to your living. Amen. Do you understand, church? That's the gospel. <laughs> How God in Christ can relate to us on every level. Just think about Jesus as a toddler running, falling, scraping his knee. He knows what that feels like. Sneezing, wiping a runny nose, goosebumps, hair sticking up. Jesus with a headache. 
Jesus with a stomach ache. Jesus seeing the pain of the world around him. Jesus being betrayed and rejected. Jesus being falsely accused, misunderstood. Does anybody know what that feels like? And we often say, you don't know what I'm going through. And God says, yes, I do. Yes, I do. In fact, I chose to feel you before I fixed you. Amen. This great God in verse 7 tells us, and this is what is known as the doctrine of kenosis. Kino means to empty yourself. This is where many Bible scholars, theologians say this is the most profound, astonishing doctrine in the Bible dealing with Jesus who made himself of no reputation. Now, before I teach it, please allow me to make the comparison. We must go backwards before we go forward. Remember when Paul said, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Let none of you out there trying to make a name for yourself, trying to make a reputation for yourself. And in complete contrast, polar opposite of us making a name for herself, you have the one who has the name above all names, making not a name for himself, emptying himself, made himself of no reputation. The idea here is what did Jesus empty himself of? Many debate, literally, they debate. Again, what did I say a couple weeks in a row? You want to have disunity? Talk about what you believe. Talk about what you believe. Well, I don't believe that. I think it's this way. We start arguing. Now we're in different camps. Talk about what you believe. You want to have unity? Talk about who you believe. And who I believe is how Jesus emptied himself. And what did he empty himself of? Not divinity. He remained God. He continued to be God. He never ceased to be God. He emptied himself, not by subtraction. He didn't take anything away. He emptied him himself by addition. He put something on. You know what he put on? Humanity. Fully God, fully man, this is the most astonishing thought you can wrap your mind around. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul again would write, hey, do you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ? You know, the unmerited favor, the charisma, the, the charis. Did you know this free gift? Did you know the grace of Jesus? Did you know what it is? When he was rich, rich in glory, he decided to subject himself to being poor in humanity. Why? So that through his poverty, you can be rich for all eternity. That's the gospel. Made himself of no reputation, which means he emptied himself. Tragic thought. It's how we come to the conclusion that Jesus is God. Can't rob something that's his. Claiming equality with his father was his rightful claim, emptied himself, never ceased to be God, just put on some skin, made himself a man, and he deserves full glory. You see, Jesus deserves full glory, yet he chose to empty himself. We, we deserve no glory, yet we're full of ourselves. Didn't I say the, the weight of this text should crush us? Now, church, please know this. Coming from one in my past who was full of himself, to be full of yourself, that expression lends itself to someone that might be prideful or arrogant, right? We often think he's full of himself. He has arrogance. But did you know there are so many other full of yourselves? Full of yourselves isn't just arrogance. Full of yourselves is even defiance. To be full of yourself can even be disobedience to God. To be full of yourself is tolerance. When you tolerate sin around you, you're full of yourself. Why? Because you don't want to come out of your comfort zone to correct, to rebuke. To be full of self is independence. There are people with well-intended wishes, plans, and dreams. They're out. They're not arrogant. They're not prideful, but they're full of themselves, which means they don't have the mind of God. They don't have a thought about God. They don't care about his plan. They are independent from God full of self. And here, what it all boils down to, all of us to be full of ourselves means we lack repentance. Remember, back to the mind. Repentance means metanoia, change of mind. To have a change of mind is to empty yourself. If God emptied himself, 
then who the heck do we think we are that we can't empty ourselves? We need to empty ourselves to the people around us. I need to fill up with the word and then empty myself. I've said this before. I have nothing for the church if I don't empty myself, fill up with the word, and administer just the word. Again, God's word. I'm not here to give a good talk. I'm here to give God's talk. And often, I'm not even here to reach the de-church, the unchurch. I'm here, and God has called me to offer the truth, to give the ability for the church to be rechurched. You ever heard that term? We need to be rechurched. Rechurched with the mind of Christ. Now, when I talk about repentance again from last week, we said repentance, having a selfless mind, cannot be changed. You cannot have that with just behavior modification. Did you know that? You need a blood transfusion. That blood that is actually running through your veins, your own nature is selfish. But when God gets inside of you and the blood of Jesus washes you, that blood transfusion makes you selfless. Hey church, I'm not talking about willpower. I am talking about a change of nature, like a complete overhaul of your wrecked and sinful nature for the mind of God to be in you, to operate within you, to see the world around you, to be selfless, to see you as better than me, to look out for your needs and also look out for my needs. It's a beautiful personal humility and a complete communal responsibility. It's remarkable. Let's continue. He made himself of no reputation. How? Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. There's a lot going on here. Let us go backwards again before we go forward. Because remember, earlier he said, being in the form of God, right? The word form. Now he's saying, taking the form of a bondservant. He was God in the form of, yet he chose to be in the form of a slave. Now the slave, of course, had no rights, no privileges. The slave at that time in the Roman Empire, no status. They were like a no man. And that's what God chose to be, a slave. And not by force, but by choice. But not just a slave. He came in the likeness of men. That means he came as you and I have come into this world, through a womb. Do you understand? You have a God who actually said, I'm gonna take off my robe of glory and I'm gonna wrap myself in the skin of humanity. I'm gonna step off my throne of light and I'm gonna insert myself into a dark womb. So when I'm born, I will feel all they feel because before I fix them, I wanna feel them. This God came to us so that we can be with him. Final thought, Christ, he entered our history not as, that word is kodios, which means Lord, but as doulos, which means slave. He chose to enter as a slave so that when he humbled himself, his father would give him the name above all names and that name would be Lord. I literally reiterate, this God of ours felt us before he fixed us. He chose to forfeit all of his advantages so we could be victorious. Church, he chose humiliation by way of crucifixion. Why would he do this? To save us. What is his name? His name is Jesus. If you do not have a real relationship with the real God in Christ, he is trying to feel you tonight. Your pain, your hurts, your shame, your disappointments, your trials. He wants to feel you and he's waiting for you to partner with him so he can fix you. He is the only one that can fix the sin ailment in your soul. He's the only one that can sanitize it and then satisfy it. He is the only one. And in case you think he went low enough when he chose humiliation by way of crucifixion, he went further still because he took all the things of our regrets, all the things of our sin, and he took it to a place where it could never haunt you again. He took it to hell so that we can be with him forever in heaven. That's the gospel.
Jesus felt us before he fixed us. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless. As a church, we believe it's our job to connect our community to Christ. So if the message today impacted you in any way, we'd like to invite you to take part in our mission and share this message with family and friends. We'll see you next week.